Welcome to the Youth Voice, a podcast giving young people a voice in politics across the island of Ireland. Today we're joined by MP John McDonnell, uh, MP for Hayes and, Har- and Harlington, and former Shadow Chancellor for the Labour Party. So welcome to the show. Oh, good, to, good to meet you, Derek. So I suppose we'll get straight in. Uh, one of the big things kind of has gripped in the world at the moment is the economy as a result of COVID and more locally, I suppose, as a result of Brexit mm. with the kind of the economic disaster that a lot of Brexit has been for the UK and for Europe and Ireland. It's kind of left a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. So I suppose, where do we go with the economy in regards to following Brexit and kind of mitigating the damage? Yeah. One of the thing. One of the important things to take into account is that the situation that we're in isn't just about Brexit or isn't just about COVID. Remember, we had 10 years of austerity from 2010. Well, it's now 11 into 12th, the 12th year of austerity. And that left us in a situation where when COVID did hit, we were so ill-prepared, both in terms of our public services, because... We'd had 10 years of savage cuts, both in terms of the NHS, but interestingly enough, in in terms of social care as well, largely privatised and underfunded. I was looking at the figures um, two years ago for the budget, uh, the government's budget, and also the um, autumn statement just before I stood down as Shadow Chancellor, and the amount cut from social care was £8 It's, you cannot sustain a public service when you have that level of cuts. In terms of the National Health Service, on average, since the NHS was founded, the investment, the increase in investment levels was around about 4% to keep pace with the growth of the demand of the NHS, particularly with regard to new treatments, but also an aging population. What the Conservatives did after 2010 is they they reduced that to just over 1%. So you had a decade of in which the individual public services were just ground down. And I, I was looking at the figures when COVID hit us. We had 100,000 vacancies in social care and 100,000 vacancies in the NHS. So we were completely ill-prepared for when COVID hit. Then the second issue is people need a sort of a level of financial resilience as well to get by when different events hit them and we didn't have that individual financial resilience because we'd had effectively wage cuts wages average weekly wages in the country were but still below the level of 2007 2008 financial crisis so when the covid pandemic hit the country was just ill prepared both financially and in terms of public services and that made it so much, the impact so much greater. And as a result of that, you know, we've had 120,000 deaths, a greater rate than per population than anywhere else on the recent figures. But in addition to that, um, in terms of job losses, it looks as though unemployment may well hit the 3 million mark if, we're, if the government doesn't act pretty quickly. So I think we're in quite a perilous state. And then, the mismanagement of Brexit is, it's a wonder to behold. It's absolutely staggering. I don't know how, how you could put it in any context, really, because what's happening now, both in terms of the trading relationships with the rest of Europe, is exactly what was predicted if they didn't get the negotiations right. That's why I was one of those who was quite a strong advocate of establishing some form of customs union as part of the negotiations. That hasn't really that really hasn't happened. And the problem is a lot of the promises that were given by the Prime Minister um, have proved to be completely fallacious. So I think we're in an extremely difficult situation. And there, there's my, what I've been arguing for, and, and others have as well, is that we need some immediate short-term measures to, to get, help people through the crisis and then start planning for the long-term future. The short-term measures are straightforward. You know, you need to make sure people aren't living in poverty. We we had figures out at the weekend that actually said that destitution had doubled. And we're not talking about severe poverty. We're talking about absolute destitution. Um, so that uh, we just need to make sure people get the income they need. So 
Universal credit is being used by the government. They've increased it by £20. They're going to hold on to that £20 increase, I hope, in the budget. Um, but we need to go further than that. We need some form of minimum income guarantee for either if you're in work or out of work. So in work, you need a proper living wage, £10 an hour at least. If you're out of work, you need a minimum income guarantee based upon a decent level of benefits. That's the first thing. The second thing is I'm running a campaign at the moment around the issue of debt because we've got large amounts of debt um, built up as a result of COVID and before. And it's not just about government debt, it's about personal and household debt. Um, there's about 1.2 million people now in severe household debt. Um, about 600,000 at least of those have not been able to pay their rent and they're falling down rent arrears, the same with mortgage. So there's a what I'm arguing for now is, of course, increase income and into people's pockets to prevent them getting into further debt. But also maybe looking at what happened during the banking crisis, where the bad debts of those banks were taken over by the Bank of England, that made them more manageable in the long term. And some of that debt was written off as well. The other issue, obviously, we've got to try and make sure that we do everything we can to come out of this pandemic as rapidly as possible. But my fear is that if you if you don't go at the pace of the rollout of the vaccines and the maintaining elements of social distancing so people are secure, if you don't do that, we're into another lockdown and that will knock the economy back again. But more importantly for me, actually, you'll mean further loss of life. And I keep saying to people, you can revise an economy, but you can't resurrect the dead. So we have to take it very carefully over the next 12 to 18 months. And if that does mean that the government has to borrow to see the economy through, well, that, that's what happens in all crises. It's exactly the same as after the Second World War and other times. You borrow and then you grow the economy in that you then pay those debts off over a long period of time. And I think that's the inevitable way forward. The other issue, just to say also, if you are planning for the long term future, which we must do, we have to recognise we're coming out of one crisis but we've got the existential threat of climate change facing us as well. So everything we do now should be around large scale investment for the future on decarbonizing our economy, shifting from fossil fuel dependency into alternative energy sources, conservation of energy, and rewilding and developing a, a proper biodiverse ecosystem. All of that there enables us then to plan for the long term. We've got to give people hope and that will bring with it the jobs that we need, but there'll be jobs which are sustainable in the long term. So that's the sort of issues I think we've got to confront and some of the ideas that we need to develop as well. Um, I suppose, continuing on from that, a big kind of focus for young people. I know next year I apply for university and I'm open to a study in England. I'm open to study in London or somewhere like that. English tuition fees and mm. the rest of the mainland UK are... Mm quite mental almost they're nine grand a year compared to over here where they're about four yeah, yeah. and it's it's almost off putting for university because you, right. you want you know it's almost the dream but then like what is the kind of how do we manage the tuition fees it's not aspect just, of uni yeah i voted against tuition fees i voted against and tony blair forced it through on a very narrow majority and i said at the time i thought it was it was just it was just on the edges of sanity, to be honest. It's a policy that was never going to work for a start. Um, there's a matter of principle here for me as well, actually. Um, from the principal position, I believe education is a gift from one generation to another. It's not a commodity to be bought and sold. That's the point of principle as a, as a socialist and as a progressive. That's what I feel. That's the first thing. The second thing, the reason the pol policy is illogical is two thirds of the tuition fee debt is not going to be paid. It's just people will are not earning enough money throughout their lifetime. So we've already seen the government last year very quietly writing off a lot of the tuition fee debt because it's just never going to be paid. So it's illogical economically. That's the first thing. It does actually. People argue it doesn't act as a deterrent effect in terms of people going to university. I think it does. But more importantly, it actually undermines the ability of some students to just, I think, develop and enjoy that educational experience. I, like my own son, there's not many uh, people I know whose 
sons and daughters go to university that don't work and work during term time, not just just during the summer. When I went to university, I was on the shop floor and did my that was at night school, went to university. And at that point, you got a decent grant. You would work during the summer. Of course you would and whatever. And maybe sometimes during holidays during the year. But most of the time you didn't because you had a reasonable income that would get you by. You, you'd be able to live a reasonable existence. Now, the pressure on young people is appalling. And it does affect the ability to study. It, it does. There's no doubt about that, the pressure that's on them. I think it's, my view is that uh, Labour Party policy under Jeremy Corbyn myself was to scrap tuition fees, and that would have been the right thing to do. Um, now I'm saying we should maintain that policy. But also one of the things that we should be pressurising this government to do is stop the rip-off rate, rates and charges that are on. The interest rates that's charged around about 5 to 6% is just absolutely scandalous. When the Bank of England base rate is 0.1%, so young people are being ripped off all around. I'd like to see tuition fees scrapped. I also think actually in terms of student debt now, now's the opportunity to actually take that over um, from, uh, by the state and get rid of it. It's interesting, Joe Biden's doing something similar at the moment by the looks of it. He's bringing forward a policy of cutting tuition fees in the states. And the debate is not whether you should, it's how much they can cut it, whether it's, it's um, significant or not. So I think it's tuition fees were a policy, I think that was never right and never going to work effectively. So therefore, now's the time to get rid of it. Interestingly enough, you know, the minister that took tuition fees through the parliament, um, the legislation, um, when New Labour was in control was Lord Adonis. Last year, he came out in favour of abolishing tuition fees because he said it hadn't worked. I think it was a huge mistake. I feel I I feel for young people actually having to go through university in that way, and then you're hit with that burden as you come out because it does affect you. There's no doubt about it, and it's just I think it's deterrent. One of the other issues as well I have to say with Brexit is I'm really worried now about the way in which the opportunities to study across Europe and have these interchanges and also the research elements now could be affected. The the UK government, Boris Johnson has said that they're going to replace the Erasmus scheme that we had for the interchange of students across Europe with a, a funding scheme from the UK government. Well, we'll see how that works. I'm, I'm anxious that it might not be as effective as the Erasmus scheme was. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, is that I have a large number of advisors and um, colleagues who do research in UK universities, um, and now some of those research grants uh, begin to dry up that were European funded because they were on the basis of having a European partner involved in the research. And that's become more difficult because the, the both the UK universities and the European university have found it very difficult to plan future research projects based upon the uncertainties post Brexit. I think Brexit has actually become I used to mispronounce it as a breakfast, but actually it has become a dog's breakfast. It really has. Anyway, we have to try and get the government to see sense on some of these things. I suppose moving on for that, uh, with Labour has, I suppose, Keir Starmer's been in a while now, but it's still not 100% certain kind of where he's lying, kind of the political compass, or if, you know, is he a socialist? Is he a centrist? You know, is it a return to blur out kind of new labour or is it you know going to be kind of a continuation of Corbyn's labour and a lot of people have kind of said that the left wing has been almost alienated by the Labour Party is that is that actually true or is it just kind of speculation there's been uh, Keir when he was um, Keir was elected in 2015 to parliament um, we appointed him to our shadow cabinet and um, he was part of one of the coup resignations, which was a bit disappointed. Then we reappointed him um, and he led it for us on the Brexit negotiations and actually did a good job. He had an eye for detail as a good lawyer should. Um, when he stood for the leadership election, I backed Rebecca Long Bailey. She was my number two for a period in the Treasury team and then went to Shadow Bays, which was and she was very effective. And she's my sort of politics. Keir stood, though, on a platform, a 10-point platform, which was a reflection of the policies we'd been pursuing in the 17 and 19 manifestos. And that's what he, the platform he stood upon. Now we're in that strange situation where 
the argument that's coming from Kia and others that we don't have to produce um, uh, basically a policy program until the general election, which is to 2024 years off, um, which is, yeah, that's true. But what I've been saying to them is actually what you need to do. You need to create, if there's any lesson from the 2019 general election, unless you've created a, a narrative and a vision of the sort of society you want to create, and you've had time to then to develop a policy program that people recognize can deliver that vision, unless you do that and take your time in doing that, um, you, you will lose, you will not win the argument. So I've been saying to Keir and his um, colleagues that you might think the general election is three or four years off. Actually, you've most probably got the next 18 months to develop the vision and the policy program, because after that, you're into the general election virtually. Uh, and don't underestimate the resources that will be thrown against you from the T Tories and their friends, particularly in the media, uh, and also the investment they'll put in the social media. So you need to be in a situation over this next 18 months where you've set that narrative uh, uh, it, it going apace, really. You've identified the sort of vision of the society you want, but you also are developing the policy program ideas. And that hasn't happened yet. And that will be the test of which direction Keir wants to take to lay party. And he says he's a socialist, and I take him at his face value. He backed the programme in the last two general elections and that we put forward. We'll see whether he builds upon it. My view at the moment is that those the two manifestos of 1719 were great, and you know we developed a range of policies. We lost in 2019, not just because of Brexit, it's because we didn't develop a narrative and a clear vision and a programme early enough to, de to demonstrate we could implement that vision to knock Brexit into a secondary issue in the election. We did that in 17, but we didn't do it in 19. So that's the mistake I'm trying to urge Keir to learn from. And as he develops that vision and the, that policy program, we'll see exactly where he stands on these issues. He did a speech last week, which was meant to be the major economic speech of setting out a bit of that narrative and it did to a certain extent but uh, what i've been saying is that's fine that it was a framing speech as they describe it now but now you need to uh, move on very very quickly on on the framing of those ideas into and this is the sort of policy that will implement that will achieve the objectives i set out in that speech one of the you know one of the uh, the issues you have to face up to is and this uh, is a reality of it, is that the mainstream media will, will come at you. If you're producing a, a program that is truly transformative, where you want to redistribute wealth and power within our society, those who have the wealth and power and they control the media because they own most of the media will come at you. Of course they will. They'll want to defend their, they want to, will want to defend their privilege. And that's completely understandable um, that they will. So you have to, use, uh, you have to be effective in using alternatives when the mainstream media is coming at you in that way. And we did it to a certain extent by, but we failed in the end because I think the, the flow was so overwhelming against us in terms of coverage in the media. We, what we did in the run up to 2017 is that um, we tried to use the mainstream media as effectively as we could, but it was obviously very difficult because it wasn't in it was in our, the hands and ownership of our opponents. But we developed social media as an alternative very effectively. And also, actually, we reinvented word of mouth as a form of political communication because of all the big rallies we were doing on a regular basis. But by 19, we'd lost the flow of the narrative. And actually, our conservative opponents caught up with us on social media, largely because of huge amounts of investment. Interestingly enough, there's a report out a week ago um, by Justin Slosberg, the professor who deals with, um, you know, he he's, does analysis of media and politics. And it showed you the 2019 campaign, the scale of investment from the Tories in social media was extraordinary, not just through the main party, but also um, through other devices as well. Some of which I think are open to legal challenge now because of the lack of registration through the Electoral Commission. So anyway, I, my message to, Kia and the others is set your framework by all means, set out that vision, but start producing 
the policy ideas and program that needs to reinforce that vision and but do it soon rather than later. Absolutely. Uh, I suppose kind of continuing on from that, uh, with the, I suppose it's in Corbyn's labour, it, it was a very almost socialist labour, it was a very definite left wing, there was yeah. no kind of question on ideology. Do you think with that kind of idea of socialism in modern Britain and the kind of modern world, do you think it, a lot of the fear is almost coming from that kind of red fear and the fear that, uh, you know, socialism is, yeah, is communism and then it's... There's an element of that still. So one of our one of our mechanisms that we were trying to use is basically um, it, it was about making our policies real for people. We were trying to say this is the sort of society that we want. Yeah. And our argument was that we want a society that's radically fairer, radically more democratic, radically more equal, in which uh, we redistributed wealth and power into the hands of working people. And to do that in a way which would then enable us to tackle all of those key issues that we're facing. The grotesque levels of inequality, the levels of well, actually poverty and homelessness, all of those issues. But also to make sure we gave people a decent quality of life. But all we added to that to try and wake people up to the fact that if we didn't tackle climate change, the next generation wouldn't survive anyway. So we, we tried to put all that together um, and to try and make that meaningful. Now, we, you know, I, we called it socialism. Actually, for most people, a lot of it was just practical realities of how you secure a decent quality of life for everyone. And one of the things we tried to do is translate that into very much what would happen on the ground in your particular community, in your town, in your area. Um, and we, we wanted to develop that on by way of we described it as community campaigning community organizing and we were recruiting community organizers on the ground and i wanted uh, we were looking at i wanted two to three hundred community organizers working in all these different areas when i was uh, on the greater london council we did that sort of thing we had people working in every one of the individual boroughs but explain to people our policies, engaging people in the development of those policies, uh, improve them and enhance them. And that's the way we wanted to go forward. We were blocked to a certain extent because we never had control of our executive of our party for two years. And the, the powers that be that were in control of the party then blocked every opportunity they took to block the recruitment of our community organisers. In the end, I think we got about 40 recruited, nowhere near enough. But the whole idea was to make our policies real, make socialism real to people in their particular community, but engage with them in making those decisions and taking those ideas further forward. So I, every other Saturday, I was doing um, I was doing meetings all around the country, small town gatherings where we'd bring people together to talk about the local area. I'd run through a few statistics about their local area, and then I'd say to people, you tell me what the reality is. And then we'd talk, it was quite fascinating really, a lot of the ideas that eventually went into our manifestos came from those discussions. Broadband, for example, we, I did a meeting in Thelma Walker, my, uh, the Labour MP's constituency up north. Um, and at one of those meetings, we had a number of small businesses there. And someone said uh, two things. They said, how did you get here? And I said, by train. And they said, was it delayed or was it cancelled? And I said, funnily enough, it was delayed. And they said, that happens every day. And he said, because we have no control of the railway service. That's why they support bringing it back into public ownership. Then another person said, um, look, our main problem here is that we, we can't expand because actually our broadband, um, our broadband speeds are so slow. Uh, and so out of that, we started doing an investigation of the role of broadband across the country. And we discovered that the private sector um, had literally all the, the connection of, of full fiber broadband was about 10%. Looked at South Korea, it was 97%. It was just ludicrous. So we were looking at ideas of how you could get full rollout of high fiber broadband. And one, what South Korea did, they set a, the state set up a, a specific company and rolled it out very rapidly. And what we thought we'd do is actually we'd bring it into all everything under public ownership invest public resources into it and then roll it out but we'd roll it out from the the least connected areas first to build them in 
And then we thought, well, what we could do is to speed it all up and make sure it's accessible and becomes a universal basic service is make it free and then tax the um, big tech companies to pay for the revenue that's needed. The government were about to give, I think they have, or they've started, they were going to give five billion to the private sector without getting anything in return. We, we looked at their figures and they admitted that actually it needed 20 billion. I said, well, we'll do that, but we'll make sure we get the benefits for the community. So all those sort of ideas that we developed came from those discussions about how, what socialism meant in a particular area. It was quite a remarkable development of um, policy making, but policy making from the grassroots upwards. I think if we'd have had another couple of years, normally the election would have come up in 2022, but with Brexit, with things fell apart and we had the election in 19. I think if we'd have had a couple more years on the basis of that local development of policies, I think we would have had stood a much better chance in the general election as we did in 17. I suppose it's actually interesting. I know we talked about the media earlier, but you know, whenever Labour rolled out the kind of idea of, you know, public service broadband, it was described as broadband communism and yeah. Wi-Fi Marxism. And then, you know, you look now and there's a very good chance that, Everyone you know, we really need it. <laughs> We're all broadband communists now. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting enough, though, Dem, when we polled um, the broadband thing on after we launched it, it had huge support. That's huge support. The issue there was... We were rapidly developing policies, and the issue there is because we never had an overall narrative, people didn't know where that linked in to that change we needed. But also, it then became credibility. So people were saying, "Well, they're doing too much; they'll never be able to do all that." If we'd have had a bit more time, I think, in building it up from the grassroots and you know having that discussion about uh, what happened locally, it's the same with our green policies. I went going around the country. I was meeting with local groups to talk about what they thought needed to happen to address climate change. <clears throat> well, one of the ideas that came up there was not just the usual wind and solar power um, and also the heat pumps, all of that was fine, plus insulation. But everyone kept on, when we were doing any coastal town meetings, they were all talking about wave power. So one of the meetings in Liverpool, for example, um, uh, the, the mayor there, Stevie Rotherham, was, he was a mayoral candidate then. He was developing an idea for a barrier across the a barrage across the Mersey, which would then provide electricity. He was looking at a couple of districts um, in, in Liverpool where they were trying to develop um, new industries, small and medium enterprises. And they were looking at developing a grid to, for those and for obviously local housing as well. So those ideas were absolutely bubbling all the time. And I think that's the way forward for our, the Labour Party's campaigning in the future is by all means announce big ideas, but demonstrate that actually on the ground what real effect it would have in changing people's lives, you know? Absolutely. I think we're going to leave it there just for time. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. To all of our listeners, thanks for listening and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, Dermot. Thanks for inviting me. It's good to have a chat.